thanks for coming uh, to the uh, second of the uh, Revolutionaries Live lecture series here at Performance Studies NYU, co-sponsored by various people, etc. Um, tonight, it's very exciting. Um, it's very exciting to have revolutionaries here, period, right now, because of what's going on downtown at Wall Street. And I hope you'll all head down there afterwards. We did that last week, and it was a lot of fun. Um, and uh, this week, I'd like to introduce um, Eric from, oh, sorry, Eric, yeah, from <laughs> Waging Nonviolence, uh, who will introduce our speaker. Hi, everybody. Um, I have to say, we, this guest speaker series is properly billed. Uh, we are really fortunate uh, to have with us, um, uh, just like last week, another Serb, since the talk went so well last week with Yvonne, and uh, who is really a true revolutionary of our time and one of the most dynamic uh, innovators of creative activism today, I believe. Uh, Serja Popovich is a, a founder and was one of the core leaders of OTPOR, the uh, student-led nonviolent movement in Serbia that used creativity and a healthy dose of humor to bring down the butcher of the Balkans, Slobodan Milosevic, in 2000. Uh, since that incredible victory, uh, Serja was actually elected to parliament in Serbia, uh, but soon kind of left politics after realizing that his real calling uh, was to teach others living under dictatorships and repressive regimes um, the ins and outs of nonviolent struggle. Um, so uh, in 2004, he started uh, a place uh, called the Center for Applied Nonviolent Action and Strategies, or CANVAS, in Belgrade, which has taken on this important task. And they've trained activists all over the world in dozens of countries. Um, from those involved in the kind of successful pro-democracy um, struggles in Ukraine and the Maldive Islands, and most recently in Egypt, um, to the ongoing struggles in Burma and Iran. So really all over the place. And it's uh, no exaggeration to say that uh, undemocratic governments around the world uh, kind of fear this guy right here. Um, so uh, we are definitely in for a treat and uh, join me in welcoming this uh, revolutionary guest we have. Thanks. Good evening and thank you for a bombastic introduction. <laughs> <laughs> and this is like uh, the, the, the basics of propaganda. I'm very glad. <laughs> I'm very glad to be here with you tonight, and I, I need to say how glad I am to get affiliated with guys like uh, Brian and Eric from, from uh, Waging Nonviolence. Also, Andy the Yes Man, who is hiding behind. I think we're very happy to have him. <laughs> and uh, we'll try to put some light on, on what is the real power behind, behind the nonviolent revolutions, and we'll try to touch a few issues and also for the purpose of documentary they're they are preparing. Uh, first of all, welcome. Uh, first of all, the, the, the I would like starting with the, with the, with the thing that, you know, you know how we, we just were coming from the pub here and we bumped into the small store where we have all of these guys making the small maquettes of various battles, how you call it, the game shop. And then I bumped into the guy preparing the small Lord of the Rings setup. Well, the Lord of the Rings, one of my favorite books, start with a claim that the world is changing. And I think this is a very good claim to start this presentation as well. If somebody could give you a crystal ball December 15th, 2010, and uh, offer you a bat and say, okay, you will look at this ball, you will see the future, uh, you will see the correct future, but you need to go out and tell it on the TV. And of course, because the curiosity kills the cat, you will accept. And then you look at this crystal ball and you see that before September 29, in 2011, Mubarak and Ben Ali would be down together with Gaddafi. Saleh would be on his knees, uh, Assad of Syria seriously challenged, uh, Osama bin Laden dead, and Ratko Mladic in Hag. And then, of course, you appear on the TV and tell about this, and the two guys in white appear and take you to the nearest <laughs> mental institution. <laughs> well, this is... Uh, what looks as a very bad year for a bad guys up to now and it is our task to see what is the real force behind it 
uh, real force behind it is something we <coughs> study and try to understand since we were involved in the Serbian revolution. And this is the phenomenon we call nonviolent struggle or people power. And uh, when you look at the reasons behind the successful nonviolent struggles, uh, what, we, what we try to, to look at in 2003, we formed this organization called Canvas, and this is very short introduction about what we do. Uh, we did workshops with people, this is out of date, from more than 50 countries now. And some of these countries are, are uh, uh, you know, classical dictatorships. Some of these countries, like United States of America, are very wide democracies. Some of these groups are opposing dictators, like the groups from Ukraine, Georgia, Syria. Maldives. Some of these groups are environmental NGOs opposing the big petrol companies like the groups who worked in Nigeria. And we try to see what is the technology which brings success to these groups. And we tried to explore into this. And because there were like two very good tools produced, one of which is a movie bringing down the dictator by American documentary Steve York which was translated into 16 different languages and widely distributed around the world. Another one is our small contribution. This is nonviolent struggle, 50 crucial points. The thing, well, you can call it a revolution for dummies. I will left a few copies here. And uh, uh, what we try to research is how this thing works. And wherever you go, you find these two opposed schools of thought. And one opposed school of thought said, that power in the society comes from the barrel of the gum. Welcome if you are ours. Um, huh? <laughs> OK. So one of these schools said the power in the society comes from the barrel of the gum, which is the Chairman Mao's words. And then you have this Stalin's famous quote once he, he said, you're going to outrage the Pope of Roman Catholic Church. He says, oh, this guy, Pope, how many battalions does he have? And this is really the story which was driving the, the political views in, in, in 20th century. And looking at the 20th century and the 21st century, there is a completely another school of thought which we kind of support. And this, we can quote Martin Luther King, or we can quote Jorge Luis Borges, which says the violence is the last sanctuary for the weak. And when you look at the dramatic consequences of both big violent conflicts and nonviolent conflicts in 21st century, welcome. Oh, that we are a growing crowd now. <laughs> Andy's preparing to bring you all after that to Wall Street to make the crowd even bigger. OK, so you look at these, these phenomenon and see, see how they work and how they operate. And you try to see what really works in this struggle. And uh, this is where we stand now when we look at the tremendous things happening in the Middle East on what we call Arab Spring. And I would like to start with the question, what is your perception on what is happening in the Middle East? Are you surprised? Come on. Students speak. This is America. Well, I was definitely surprised mm -hmm. and delighted mm -hmm. and hope that um, what I, uh, uh, someone put on the internet that uh, Gaddafi actually was trying to nationalize everything in his country and that's why he's being supported. No, but his, his downfall is being supported. Mm -hmm. I hope that's not true. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but, and, and nevertheless, delighted that uh, 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 these, these megalomaniacs are being uh, mm -hmm. brought down. I think it's, uh, it's wonderful. I, and I, you know, um, I would look forward to uh, the megalomaniacs who are very quiet in this country also to, mm -hmm. <laughs> to be faced. <laughs> Okay, but what we, what we, the whole world looked very surprised from the very beginning. And what we see, I think this has to do a lot with a completely wrong perception, welcome, of the situation in the Middle East. And what, uh, come on, welcome, welcome, just do it fast. Oh, no problems. So the, the whole perception of Middle East with which we have been fed for years, and uh, it's probably very similar here as we got in Serbia, is that it's a frozen region. And this is a kind of a refrigerator where we have only two meals, hamburger and a salad. And hamburger se sits for a police or military type of uh, dictatorship, mostly secular, which holds the evil Muslims under the good boot. And then you have this another scenario, which is a Tehran type of theocracy. And these are two meals, and this is what you can get from this refrigerator. 
well, guess what? This perception was completely wrong. And it's probably basically generationally wrong because when you look at the average age of these countries, it is 24 in Egypt with Mubarak 32 years in power. It is 25 in Tunisia with Ben Ali 26 years in power. It is less than 27 in Libya with Gaddafi 42 years in power. It is more than 30 years of Assad's family in, in Syria with 23.5 years average age. So the whole generation have grown, which is very difficult to be fed with, a, you know, good old stories in Iran, like, you know, if you are misbehave, we will bring you Shah back. The people don't know who the Shah is <laughs> because they were, they're just too young. And then when you look in the mentality of these people, they're mostly open-minded. They have the new ways to communicate. They're even using the language which my generation, I'm 38 now, has strong difficulties to understand. These people gather on the social media. These people date via different new media. And they have a completely different lifestyle. So I think one of the things which was hardly overseen in the, in the Middle East is the fact that the whole new generation has grown. And when you look at the 18th date of the Tahrir Square and you see the government in Egypt praying that the people will move from the street, it's ridiculous. We are talking about a nation of teenagers. For them, the whole life was there. And whoever knows anything about the teenagers, he wouldn't expect them to get removed from the street by themselves. So this is very big generational phenomenon. So when you look at these struggles from Gandhi, Martin Luther King, and then throw the Philippines, and South Africa, and Lech Walesa, and Poland, and Serbia, you try to distinguish what are the main principles on which they work. And uh, there are different opinions what may be important for a successful nonviolent struggle, but we try to focus on the things we call principles. And my, my question to you is, what, in your opinion, may be the principles of successful nonviolent struggle? What do you really need to win in nonviolent struggle? Persistence. Persistence, very good. Numbers. Numbers, yes. This is the core of the nonviolent struggle, lies in numbers. And this is such a big difference with military struggle. You can really win inside the military struggle if you have a s relatively small number of well-trained and equipped people. There is no chance you will win in, in nonviolent struggle if you don't have numbers. So really growing numbers, thinking about numbers, mobilizing numbers, putting numbers on street, and maintaining momentum, because without the momentum, the numbers will go down, really makes the core of your success. This is a very good point. What else? You need a way to organize. Yes. What else? Strategy. Strategy, of course. But even before strategy, you need something else. That's it. It, no, tactics is a little bit down. So you have the strategy over here, and you have the tactics down. But what comes first? Oh. Vision. Because vision is what you really need in order to win in nonviolent struggle. This is a simple question. Where do I want to be? Okay, I need to speak at Harvard in Boston at Wednesday. So I know where I want to be Wednesday, October the 5th. But how I'm going to get there, this is my strategy now, OK? I may use plane, I may use train, I may even start early on a bicycle today if I'm environmentally friendly. And then at the end of the day, if I use the train and plane, then I need to get to the you know, JFK at some point. So will I use the taxi or the train? So now the tactics go down. But before that, you need to have the vision. And the biggest a uh, real problem in nonviolent struggle is whether or not, or not you know where your country is heading through. And this also works for transition. So the biggest question in Egyptian or Tunisian transition is are they people, do they know where they want to be? Because if they know, it's a good news. And they will put the pressure on whoever is pursuing the transition to bring them there. But if they don't know, or if they think that removing dictator is the aim for itself, then you can expect a big mess in this country. And this is probably the most important difference between the successful and unsuccessful transition is whether or not people do have this vision and do have this plan, what is the country they would like to live once the struggle is over? Not once dictator is out of the office. Dictator out of office is one step towards the struggle which is over. Normally you look 
Well, my organization tend to work with the Egyptians, especially the group April 6, and it was all over the news media. And since the very beginning, we noted that these guys know what they want. They were very much into removing Mubarak, but they were also very much into you know, building a kind of the secular, free, normal country. And I, I think they had this clear vision. Whether or not they can carry on this vision or, or different forces will overtake, we can discuss later. But from the very beginning, they have it. We met them in 2009. In 2009, they told us, this is going to be the window of opportunity. The weak point of Mubarak regime would be succession. Nobody wants his son to succeed him. Military doesn't want him. Business community doesn't want him. People think that the time of Pharaoh is behind them, so they don't really expect the president leaving the country to his son. In Arab world, dignity is everything. So if people s feel disgrace, they will be easily mobilized to push. The time we wait for is August 2011. Tunisia happened before. They were pissed off because the bloody Tunisians done it. And they consider themselves elder civilization and more serious stuff. If you speak to Egyptians, they will tell you that. We were so pissed off that they made it. So we need, so they made an early start. Like, instead of waiting for August, they started a little bit earlier. But my point here that this was planned. Somebody was planning this. And there is no such thing as a successful, spontaneous nonviolent revolution. Forget about this. This is not happening spontaneously. You want to make things spontaneously, you, you, you create a mess. And, and n normally, it's not successful. So you look at the three different things. One thing is universal principles. And they're like, if you look at these struggles, you must say that there are like three things you need to have in nonviolent struggle. First one is unity. Unity of purpose, unity of people, unity within the organization. Uh, we learned it the hard way. The, the Serbian nonviolent movement lasted 10 years, but only actually in the last two years we understood that we need to put an equal pressure on fragmented opposition parties <coughs> as we need to put on the government in order to achieve the change. The second one is planning. As I mentioned, there is no one single successful nonviolent tactics which you can perform without the planning. And the third one, which is a very, very big issue nowadays is nonviolent discipline. What do you think nonviolent discipline may be? Well, you uh, have to fight back, is to take, is to not resist. But it is also the very big misconception that people normally equal. Because, you know, the first figure, when, when you say nonviolent struggle, what is the first figure which comes to your mind? Gandhi. 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 This slim, bald-headed guy with his glasses. And this is why people normally mix nonviolent struggle, nonviolent discipline with the term nonviolence. Nonviolence stands for something ethical, something passive. Nonviolent discipline is something you train your people to do. Your people are not getting involved in violent actions, not because of their religious belief, but because they know the moment they throw the stone, this one stone will be on the cover page of the newspaper, not 100,000 people in a peaceful march. Because they know this is how we'll make the excuse to the regime to use violence. So the violence is the most contaminant pollutant to every nonviolent struggle. This is why we say nonviolent discipline. This is something you train your people to do. So second very important thing is a dynamic no nobody really Noted. This is like in video game. You met Ivan last week. He was designing a video game on a nonviolent struggle. And like in many video games, you have this energy, fuel, strength, you know, magic, I don't know. In nonviolent struggle, you have two big parameters. One is fear, another one is enthusiasm. So when you see enthusiasm growing, it's like day two on demonstrations. You can police shooting the tear gas on Egyptian youth, and they're running towards the police, not from the police. Then you understand that something is wrong. Because these coercive regimes, which are relying on a coercive pillars like military, police, judiciary, they cannot operate without the fear. Without, without the fear. Because sanctions work only if people are afraid. If people are standing in queues to get arrested, like it happened with the people in Nashville uprising here in the US, or in Serbian uprising against Milosevic, you, know, you couldn't get laid 
if you were not arrested in Serbia in 2000. <laughs> Literally. You would cons there must be something wrong with you. And when you get into the mentality where people are starting competing, who is going to get arrested first? And then if this guy was arrested five times, you know, he's a really big hero in a school, and this guy, he's very suspicious. Because nobody really wants to sit with him, because there must be something wrong with him. Police never came to school to catch him out. So, I mean, when you have this type of the mentality, really sanctions don't work. Because sanctions work only when fear is there. And when you look at these situations, you can find a tremendous, crazily, non-violently disciplined people up, up to now. I hope they wouldn't turn violent now in Syria, where we have 2,000 people really killed, shoot, with live rounds. But still they come out on the street. And this where the, the this where you need to do something to restore the fear. The Tiananmen thing. You need really to slaughter a lot of people or to accommodate, like Moroccan king. We'll go to referendum, change the constitution, accommodate to the people, and the things will settle down. So this is how the things operate. You look into the fear of enthusiasm. And then the last thing is uh, tactics. And uh, the, in this tactics, there is, I, I suppose, Ivan was telling you a lot about the use of humor and how it is important. But also, when you look at these, these oppressive regimes, the more oppressive regime is, the better use of low-risk tactics. So what we are witnessing now in the Middle East is that people really understand this. So you have this, the theory of nonviolent struggle we teach really focuses on two, ta two types of tactics. One is what we call the tactics of concentration. And when I say nonviolent struggle, what's your first association with it? What do you imagine? What is your media picture of people power? Marches. Yes, marches. A lot of people on the street, rallies, speeches, transparency. All of this we call tactics of concentration. You put all of your eggs in one basket. You put a lot of people on the street. It is very intense. The number of the people is big, so it is concentrated. The time is concentrated. So within two hours, everybody spends this uh, two hours there. And then it's also very costly in the terms of money, because you need a lot of effort to bring these people to one place. Guess what? This is exactly what the regime wants you to do. They will put you, the people on the camera, like in Iran. They will come in 14 days, arrest them in homes. They can, <coughs> the big crowd can be easily dispersed, the stuff like that. And this is where you get vulnerable. Because once the people don't, uh, don't see the effect of the big rallies, they will stop, stop, stop coming. Instead of that, like 10,000 people, two hours, this is 20,000 hours. What if we use 20,000 hours to do what our friend John Jackson calls small acts of resistance? Like, can you imagine how the New York will look after 20,000 hours of spraying graffiti? <laughs> Just think about the perception or the quantity of message you can spread within the 20,000 hours. So, when you look at these tactics, you can look them from a different ways. So you can look them from the point of how much resources you put into the tactic, and then also you can look at from the from the cost, and you can look them from the effect. And when it comes to the oppressive system, you want to really disperse. You want to disperse numbers, time. You want to disperse risk into the wider population. And there is this phenomenal story about the miners in Chile getting inside a strike, and they were facing Pinochet. That was a very harsh guy, ready to shoot. Instead of being surrounded by the military and shooting, people say, OK, this is not going to work. But what if we start walking half speed and driving half speed? And of course, they collapsed Santiago within a matter of hours. And this also served as a way for people to recognize each other. So it really built the identity in the movement. And when the people are driving half speed in a rush hour in a big city, it is very difficult to arrest somebody, to accuse somebody of something, because you know there is a speed limit. That means you cannot drive faster than 40 miles. But if you, what if you drive two miles? There is absolutely no ban upon which you can be trialed. So, then also it is very difficult to see who the hell started this mess. Because everybody is driving half speed. So you can really say, oh, this is this guy, and we know him. 
no, no, I'm just running. What should I do? Should I park my car and leave? Yes? Sorry? Where, where? What's Cochabamba? Can you tell the story? That, yeah, Bechtel came in and they, they made a deal. Uh -huh. uh, the government needed water, they needed drilling, they needed wells. Uh -huh. And the World Bank told them that they had to, no, they didn't get the money, uh -huh. they bought the. Uh, What else? Similar definition. Uh, states a certain statement of exclusivity. It isn't. But what else? Is, what else appeals to emotion? Oh yes, it appeals to emotion. Like anything in communication, appeals to emotion. This is like, especially when you when you are looking at this brand product. Like the brand is also something which guarantees you the same experience every time. Which means McDonald's stays the same on Fifth Avenue or in Kinshasa. So you make sure that this is something you recognize and you get attached to it. Well, guess what? Branding can and do have the very important thing in the, in the social movements, and especially when you combine it with understanding of the strategy and variety of the tactics. So I would like to point your attention. Uh, Andy. Yes. Let's go down. Let's go down. Or what? Can you find the thing we put? Help me, this is Apple, I'm hopeless. There are no buttons on the mouse. Yeah, I know. <laughs> How the heck can you do Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, 
21st century. Now we don't have neither. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So this is like the, the, the something we're going to to look at and you will understand how we've done it in Serbia and then we can discuss how we can do it elsewhere. This 10 minute clip is called Branding in Serbia. It was done by the guys who were involved in my movement and they formed a kind of small advertising agency layer and made a movie which is used for educational purposes. Okay? Okay, questions? Yes. Um, so, what's important first, mm -hmm. before any of this can happen, is that the people need to agree that there's a reason to do this. Mm -hmm. And uh, when, I, uh, when I think about this country and the many things that I know and resist and feel unfair, uh, my feeling is that I'm a very, very, very small minority. And anybody else mm -hmm. who I try to tell this to, they, a scrim comes before them in complete denial. Mm -hmm. Because they don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear about the banking system. If you describe it to them, mm -hmm. they hear all of these things. 9-11, people go blank. Mm -hmm. I mean, all of this stuff. 99% of the people in this country do not want to hear about it. And that's a problem. You, mm -hmm. can't, you can't do this unless people agree. And how does one educate a, a public that, that, that wants to be in denial? Now, I wonder if there isn't subliminal advertising on television that tells people, we're taking Sleep. care of it, Sleep. you're in trouble, <laughs> stay at home. <laughs> Sleep. The, 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 that's, that's the big point on one hand. And then on another hand, there are at least uh, two successful examples of nonviolent struggle in this country. And one is, of course, the struggle for civil rights movement, and another one is the struggle for gay rights movement. And uh, when you look <coughs> at these two successful movements, which are absolutely made in America, both of them, one of them made, made in the South, another one made in San Francisco, but both more or less American brands, you can see that they had the similar obstacles in the beginning. And the movement you've seen here started as a group of 11. Uh -huh. So you always start small, and there is no such thing as a <coughs> nonviolent movement starting with big numbers. Numbers is something you gain. And then you look at this, and when you understand the, 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 what you are struggling for, is actually on one hand you're gaining your authority and your numbers, and on the second line you're gaining more and more political and social space. And the good news about this country is that you can rely on a lot of political space. Okay, there is a lot of existing political space which people can exploit if they want to do it. And then on another hand is gaining numbers. Now the big question is how you do it. And the simple answer you wouldn't expect is through the small victories. So what you really do, you have a small group and you say, okay, this is how much resources I have. I have 11 people, they all work. All they can spend is two hours a week. <coughs> but that's 22 hours a week to do something. And then within 22 hours a week, you can perform a street theater, start a petition, make a Facebook group. You can list the things you can do. But it is very important when you achieve something very small to know how and when to proclaim victory. Because this is how it works. It works like stairs. And you know, this is how you will attract number 12 and number 13, and maybe number 15, and this will give you 30 hours next week. Mm -hmm. So now you will you know, have more and more resources. And it really sounds disappointing, but this is how it works. The history of successful nonviolent movement in Serbia is 10 years of failures. The history of Martin Luther King movement is probably 25 years of failures. The history of Harvey Milk movement is 15 years before he was elected. And he started as a group of five people in Castro Street. The reason he grown was that he was capable to exploit from the small victories. And then another thing, he understood that you need to bridge the social distance. 
The way to win in nonviolent struggle, the way to gain numbers, is to talk to those who don't agree with you. The real problem is that if you make this exclusively far left thing, for example, like you know Wall Street, whatever, and before you start drugging mid path people or right wing people, you will never win. And you need to understand this, that there is this social distance through which you need to bridge. And if you're capable to bridge it, then you will start winning. Because Martin Luther King would never win if it really was only the thing for American black people. Because black people were a minority. They could easily be overwhelmed. But when they start dragging in normal thinking, white, ethnically white people, he will start winning. So start small, build from small victories, pick the battles you can win. Don't call for the demonstration when you have 11 people. Because the turnout would be ridiculous and you will show your weakness. But there are so many different tactics of nonviolent struggle, you've seen some of them, which you can do when you have the, 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 the 11 people. And one of the reasons we were successful is that we were capable by graffiti, by you know, having, for example, idols, you know, these public persons wearing the badge, you know, actors like the Broadway actors ending up their big show. Can you imagine the guy from Spider-Man now, you know, ending, you know, he's go there, he's, the audience is clapping, you know, he shows you the clenched fist under his costume. So we were not such a very big group, but we knew how to display our message. And then the people are coming home and start thinking how this really is a massive movement, because perception is reality. People first start perceiving this as something important, and then it becomes important. It sounds ridiculous when you say it this way, but this is exactly how it works. Ladies? Mm -hmm. What you're missing is the shared vision that you mentioned at the beginning. You have to start creating a shared vision. I think Obama did that to a large extent. He had a movement there and mm -hmm. had this shared vision. It didn't, you know, lead that far. But it know? was a movement, yes. It was a movement at that time. It was closest to the movement I've seen in American politics for decades. Yeah. Uh, along the lines of what I'm interested in what lessons you can share with us about articulating a vision and the kind of language that you use to make a vision more inclusive. Uh, you talked about um, the necessity for a, a, a movement to appeal to a broader audience. Uh -huh. I mean, I think with the breadth, for instance, just happening in Wall Street, often what the changes that need to be made are like not that sexy. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I'm interested in your perspective on that. There are two, two things. It's like uh, one is... Uh, how you formulate the vision, then the other one's how you appear sexy. Yeah. So this, this doesn't necessarily is related yeah. to one another. The, 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 uh, the difference between writing the vision and creating the vision, uh, in s the difference between success and fail is how you make it. And uh, the way we, t the lesson number one, it's like when we do this workshop, like you have this introduction part and then the first block of instruction, like hour and a half, is teaching people how to develop the vision. And uh, this starts with a huge understanding of if you need numbers in your nonviolent struggle, there must be something for somebody in this vision. Because people will join movement only if they consider things personally important. There is not more than 5 to 10% of the people who would be socially active because of the ideas. Okay, these people are very important. They drive the society forward. But if you really look at the numbers, you look where the numbers lie. And then you learn to listen to the people. You go to women and talk to them. You go to employers and talk to them. You, go, you pull the vision out of the people. You ask them, how is America you would like to live in would, would look like? And then you listen to them. And then you pull the commonalities from this. And this is, there was this, uh, last year, we took uh, our good friend and uh, New York Times uh, journalist Tina Rosenberg to one of our ro workshops in, in, uh, with Burmese. And before that, we were sitting in, in a pub and I was telling her, you will have the biggest shock of all tomorrow because you will witness how the normal people from Burma, by using this tool, are creating the vision of tomorrow and there will be no be democracy in it. Because people wouldn't give a damn about democracy. They would talk about the normal life, 
equal job opportunities, equal educational opportunities, you know, uh, healthy and prosperous economy, better education. You will listen to all of this stuff. But all of this matching, there will be like a very small number of the people who really think about the democracy. And then you have this movement telling them that what they need to risk for is democracy. But guess what? The Arab Spring started on bread and butter issues. It was bread and butter issues predominantly driving Tunisia. It was 80% of bread and butter issues keeping people on Takrir Square. It was the struggle for you know, self-determination, for military dictatorship, for human rights, for freedom. But it was before all driven by the socio-economic grievances. And when you say political space, you don't erase <coughs> this social space. from. This is the space for you. In many cases, I mean, when we were talking to the guys from April 6, the name of April 6 is the date of the big workers' demonstrations in 2008. And I asked them, why, why, why have you picked this name? They said, because we got pissed off. Every time students go out and demonstrate for political freedoms, we get tear gas. Every time workers get out and demonstrate about uh, salaries, they get concessions. We were looking to those who are successful. This is how we named our movement. I mean, this is a blunt answer from a guy who is 19 years old. But it really makes sense. So the long answer to your question is, you listen to the groups you want to include. And then you look at the commonalities in what they consider important. And this is how you tailor the vision. To pack it in a sexy way, it's something else. It will be the number of the sentences, the number of the values and stuff like that. Like environmental vision of the world, when you put it on two pages, it's a probably most boring text, which includes the 350 milligrams per 1 million liters of air, whatever. So you, I cannot understand I'm a graduated biologist. But you know, how to make recycling sexy and throwing garbage through the window not sexy this is the work of the, of the propaganda. And, and of course you will use propaganda. Of course. It's normal. You were one of the original 11 Akbor, correct? Mm -hmm. What does Akbor stand for? And was it just your, your you guys created that? So uh -huh. Akbor stands for? Otpor uh, is the Serbian word for resistance. resistance. And, but also Otpor itself is a, uh, it's very mu much relied on an, an emotional thing. Uh, we are the, the nation of teenagers, uh, not in our age, because we are very old. We don't reproduce. We will die soon, fortunately, for the world. But, uh, <laughs> but in our mentality. No, no, whenever you need a revolution or trouble, you bring a Serb. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, the, the thing is like, the thing is like uh, Serbs love doing things in spite of things. This is very present in our history, in the way we think. So Otpor was the idea of individual resistance. That was not only the resistance movement, like you have one from the forest. It also relies to the idea that I know the regime is oppressive and powerful, but I will kick some asses in spite of the fact they think I cannot do it. So it really relates to the mentality. And third and very important, the clenched fist was, uh, was taken out for the three reasons. First. It was the symbol of the anti-fascist movement, very powerful anti-fascist movement in my country, because it was leftist, it was kind of communist, and the people were saluting each other with the fist. So we grew up in a school learning to salute with this. But this is a very important part of our history. We are very proud of the fact that my country was the only country in Europe, except Great Britain, which was never 100% conquered by the German, Nazi Germany. So we were very much involved into this, and we had this stuff. So when you have the occupation, you need resistance movement. You understand the message. And then the fist stands for unity as well. So the first message was get yourself together, live the resistance. And it's also very handy for putting it on the wall. And it's tough shape. It's coming that its first design was coming from a cardboard for graffiti. So it really stayed this re really sharp. And it was copy-pasted in many struggles. It was copy-pasted in, in Georgia. It was copy-pasted in, in, in Egypt. One-on-one -on -one copy-paste, like the one you've seen, seen in the movie. It became very popular. The guy who, the guy who made it is uh, one of the best friends I've ever had. Uh, we grew together, sit in a bench in elementary school. And in, two, in 998, when we were making Otpor, 
We said, okay, who is going to design the face? Duda is his name. Well, Duda will do it. I said, is he good? I said, I don't know, but he'll do it for free. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but skills and knowledge are such a useful resource as well. And I mean, you may have 11 people, but among these 11 people, you can find some tremendous skills. Like, we had our website before we had office. That's something when we are talking of 998, okay? Now everybody can have a website, but 998, it was such an exotic animal. <laughs> so you could get listed, you could get drafted in a movement by, you know, putting an online form, and somebody would really call you with a telephone. In 1998, this was future in Serbia, really. This was something political organizations didn't even think they would ever use. But you know, there was this crazy guy who was studying in the UK and came back and said, I've seen the Greenpeace is doing this, we're going to do this. So we will recruit people through the internet. What? <laughs> through what? But it worked, so it was skills, yes. Mm. Uh, this is one of your intermediate goals to, to, to change the guy. What you do is you design vision, you talk to people, and you came out <laughs> with the things which are most important in society. And Otpor's vision of tomorrow was uh, we er very early we put together a student's organization and came out with a kind of a strategic document which was called the Declaration of the Future of Serbia. Such a big word. But actually it was a set of things we stand it for, and one, one group was freedoms and democracy. It was like free press, free university, independent judiciary, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, and free and fair elections. And then second set was uh, about where do we want to go. And we say the place for Serbia is as a member of EU. And the third thing was what we'll do with the neighbors, because we were so tormented with five wars. Milosevic put my country in five wars and lost them all within the 10 years frame. This is ridiculous. So we said, we went to cooperation instead of conflict with neighbors. So that was set of goals. And you know, removing Milosevic was a tool to get there, not the goal for itself. It was one of the intermediate strategic goals, what to remove this guy. But we still haven't gotten to the EU. So you know, the struggle is ongoing. The good news is that now you have two thirds of the population in my country supporting these goals. And then you have at least this set of goals re relying on freedoms and free and fair elections in place for 10 years already. But it, we are still working on this. We are getting there. If you guys let us in. <laughs> you don't look like you're going to do it, but maybe we'll do it in spite of you as well. <laughs> Is it essential for a nonviolent movement to have a charismatic that's a good. That's a great question. What do you think? Mm -hmm. But it does seem like it's necessary. Well, uh, it is very important for successful movement to have capable leadership. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't necessarily mean you need charismatic leader. Charismatic leader is cool if you have one. <laughs> and when you look at the charismatic leaders, there are few, like Gandhi, Martin Luther King, and stuff like that. And these guys really worked in their movements. That was cool. But the role of the leadership can be also delegated to the less visible group. And uh, the things which are good with a charismatic leader can be also very vulnerable for the movement. Charismatic leaders get killed. Charismatic leaders get arrested. Charismatic leaders get expelled. Charismatic leaders get, get co-opted. Co charismatic leaders get corrupted. Charismatic leaders get satanized in media. There are, the list is longer, but these are the first few things which can come to your mind. But, for example, my organization did have the really strictly kind of hidden leadership. It was a oligarchy of the people running the show. And then you have a lot of people who were speaking in public who were not really decision makers. They were maybe in a wider circle of 50 to 60 people, but they are good public speakers and they were a good face of the movement. And, for example, in the Egyptian movement, you can even have the visibly leaderless movement, which is run by the committee, which you will never see, 
but also it can operate very efficiently. So the, the point here is, no, nonviolent struggle doesn't really require a charismatic leader. And even some of the people you consider to be charismatic leaders, li like Nelson Mandela, were efficiently cut from any leading by being put on Robben Island. Really, he was serving more like a symbol of the struggle than he could operate the movement day by day, you know, from an from a island uh, high security jail. But, you know, it's like, if it's not Mandela's face, then it can be a fist. If it's not a fist, it can be a collar. So you find a replacement for the fact that leaders are, you know, powerful group identity thing. But there are also other things which can be powerful group identity things. So the answer is yes, you need capable leadership, but you don't necessarily need charismatic leader. It's good if you have one. So what's the strategy and tactics for when violence tries to co-opt the struggle? To co-opt the struggle. So that means w w you're asking when you have the violent response from the government or when you have no. the violent fraction in the struggle? When there's a fraction. There were several cases. This is also the good question. And, uh, and uh, w the, to remind you that the reason why Nelson Mandela was sitting in a Robben Island was that he didn't want to condemn the violent fraction and violent activities of African National Congress. People really don't know this. They say, oh, he's a, such a powerful symbol of nonviolent movement. That's rubbish. He was actually very firmly supporting that, you know, limited violence is the only answer to blah, 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 which is why he was sent to jail. Uh, there must be, you can operate on three levels. First level is you avoid people getting involved in violent activities. You train people to stay nonviolent. B, you develop a relationship between you and your opponent. So when you talk to the police, it is less possible that somebody will throw the stone. If you have uh, priests, like in Burma, or girls, like in Serbia, in the front rank of your demonstration, it is less likely that you will have the violent outbreak from your own side. So you do all of these techniques to diminish the possibility of violence. And you try to cut yourself from affiliation with every violent group. And we had this. We, we, in Serbia, it was soccer fans. This sport, which is called football, but only here it is called soccer. <laughs> because another sport where people carry ball here is called football. <laughs> but this is not the subject of discussion. <laughs> so the football fans, soccer fans, were very anti-regime and very violent. And they were crawling to get flags with fists and, and t-shirts with fists. If we would give them this t-shirt, we would be doomed. Because they would get involved in a conflict with the police within days. It could be used by the regime to discredit the movement. And we would be history within a matter of weeks. So now it is a big issue what is happening in Syria. You have this large component of nonviolent movement. And then you have so much military de defection. So soon we will witness the free Syrian army <coughs> shooting in a, in a Syrian official army. And this is going to be the big challenge for this struggle. Because if they don't know how to mute or disarm this violent component, or at least make a distance to the violent component of the movement, then the, the movement can be consumed by its violent component. And this is the danger, because to come back to the very beginning, the real trouble with having violent component, except that people get killed. I mean, the explanation of the Syrians will be that people get killed any, anyhow, so with or without us shooting. Of course, violent component of the movement will make spiral of violence going even faster. We'll get more excuse for the violent outbreak. But how it really damages the movement, except for the reputation, is numbers. Uh, when you look at the violent struggle, who are your potential members, soldiers, rebels? Where do you look? You look at the male, mostly, between 18 and 40, 45, healthy, capable for military training. That's a very narrow group when you speak in numbers. When you talk about nonviolent struggle, you can look like half of your manpower are women. One third of, the, of, of my organization in Serbia were high school kids. Very efficient in, in, in demonstrating, carrying on low risk action, participating in marches, doing graffiti, uh, even dragging down the websites of the government. They, they were tremendously efficient in carrying many tactics of nonviolent struggle. These kids, 
They were so good. And when you look at the, at the Arab Spring, you can see them even, you know, organizing kids' demonstrations on the street, chanting slogans, stuff like that. So when you look at the violent struggle, when the bullets start wh whistling, people stay home. So that's the biggest problem with a violent component. So you need to kill it, like, you know, to dismantle it from the movement from the very beginning. Because without nonviolent discipline, you can be doomed. Yes? To what degree do you think a successful nonviolent movement needs to be completely transparent and openly democratic versus more stealthy, Machiavellian, like doing whatever it takes to get the next uh, victory? This is, uh, this is a big debate. And, and the coming from the movement which was organized more like a political campaign than really as a democratic organization, I can tell you that these movements can be efficient while the, the, there is certain democracy in uh, bringing decisions. But democracy in executing decisions will lead you to anarchy. So you don't want really to have a very big debate about these decisions. So it's depending on how you, how you structure it. It doesn't necessarily need to be a representative political organization where, where everybody is elected to the organs of the movement. But then on another hand, it requires uh, certain, uh, certain democracy in decision-making process because without it, it's, I mean, you, you're replacing one autocrat with another. So it requires a certain level of democracy. But it is not necessarily something you want to be very transparent as a process because there may be a certain decision-making point which you want to protect from the government. Not necessarily to hide from the members, but to protect part of your communication from any kind of infiltration. Which is uh, what I'm wondering about. How did you manage to stay, you know, the leadership, how did you manage from being arrested and thrown all over the place? M well, most of 11 people who founded Otpor have been arrested at least once, including me. So I mean, we didn't manage to, to avoid harassment. The trick is that when we, we, when we were very small in the beginning, we were just teasing, teasing, teasing. And then we started growing. And because Serbia is such a small country, you know, we knew the people who were retired from secret police. And we knew the people inside the regime. And we were warned when the crackdown will start. And before that, we, we sat with these guys who were in the secret police service. And you know, one of the real troubles with dealing with oppressive regimes is that you give them too much credit. <laughs> That's true. And you start by understanding that you never focus on intentions of your opponent. You never say, OK, regime will kill and arrest all of us. You focus on capabilities. Whether they really can do it is another issue. So what we learned from these guys who were retired people from secret police is how the secret police really operate. So you will get physical surveillance. You will get your telephone on the tap. But they are absolutely incapable. If, if we do things by sitting in cafes on a public place, and this is exactly how we operate. It's like I would meet two other guys on a public place in a cafe. We will exchange the piece of information. And then one of them will go there and meet two other guys. And I will go there and meet a few other guys. And it's also, you, you will find this here, the, this lecture called how you communicate with telephone. And it is not what you say, but how you say it. And you can deny them possibility to understand what you do. And by doing this in public places, by fragmented, and 11 of us never met last six months of the campaign altogether. Mm. We were meeting in smaller groups. So we make sure that if they arrest, they arrest two or three guys. And then again, the certain piece of information was protected. Like, the fundraising people and money spending people would know part of the information. And the guys involved in education, for example, will know the list of the trainers regionally. So if they arrest one of us, they cannot pull the whole picture, even if, if, if they would make me speak. So that was a way of making it this, this level. Then the second thing, Otpor was a kind of a very efficient group, but in the same time, it was highly decentralized. So it was a group of the 20 people, like 11 to 20 people in the decision-making process. And then there was this factory of people who were making leaflets, logos, stuff like that. But they were replaceable. And then in every city, you could have a small cell, five, six people. And they were given the materials coming from Belgrade, but the ideas for the activities was their own. 
So there were internal competition between local branches who is going to create a bigger mass. And we were fueling this internal competition, not even trying to control the guy on the field, because this internal competition was very good for the movement. And it really encouraged people to bring their own ideas. And the people work best if they feel the ideas are their own. So it was, in a, by making it very decentralized, we really made the arresting of the top 11 people senseless. Because even if they could distinguish that these 11 people are running the show and arrest us in one day, the, the show would go on. Because Snake did have a, more than one head. It was very difficult to arrest all the layers of leadership at the same time. And it was complicated for the regime because you know these people were in different cities. They were appearing in different times. So one of the biggest mistakes of Iranians is that they want to do the demonstration Tuesdays 4 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> so that they made sure that the police don't get too tired. They just appear at 3 p.m. <laughs> Two more. Sorry, I didn't understand the question. <laughs> there's a tipping point. There's, there's a critical mass or uh -huh. point in, the, in, in your movement where Milosevic stepped down or slowed uh -huh. down or, or yes. whatever. Was that tipping point part of your strategy? Yes. Or was it incidental? Yes, yes, yes. It was the part of the strategy because we knew exactly that we want to remove Milosevic on the elections. We had the previous experience or previous communication goal. 96, 97, Milosevic has stolen local elections. And the people demonstrated for 100 days. And at the end of the day, under pressure of the international community and the pressure from the street, he admitted the original results. So we understood that this is the winning scenario for us. And then when you look at Serbia, Georgia, and Ukraine, uh, we, because we could predict what he will do. If we bring enough people in the elections, he can steal two or 300,000 votes. He was stealing on the province of Kosovo. So we exactly know how much he could steal. So if we bring 5 million voters to the voting polls, even if he gets 2 million and steals 300,000 more, we will know that we will win. Then what is he do going to do? He is going to proclaim that he won. This is when the shit will hit the fan. Because the reason why stolen elections are such a powerful trigger is it makes struggle personal. This is what we mentioned a few minutes ago. Before elections are stolen, it's between I don't know, Milosevic and the opposition leader. The moment the government steals the vote, it steals your vote. So now it's between you and the government. It's not about the politicians anymore. So this is why stolen elections are such a powerful trigger, which mobilizes the people whom you wouldn't normally expect to be a part of the political pro protest of the demonstrations. So we wanted to lure him into this trap. <laughs> because we exactly knew how he will behave. So parallelly, we were running the campaign against Milosevic, which was called Gotovia, which means he's finished. We were preparing the public opinion for, for, for the night when we will go out and proclaim that we won the elections. So everybody was ready for this. And then we say, OK, but he's going to steal. But we know this, so there will be 15 days in which we'll block the country, prepare the general strike, and kick the guy's ass. So this is how it is going to be. And guess what? When we see the numbers in the night of the elections, and we understood that we have more than 4.5 million out, we started celebrating. And it was very important that we start celebrating <laughs> before he says anything. Because when he said it, nobody really trusted him. So for him, it was, you know, calling for a second round of elections. He said, there is no second round. I mean, he's goodbye. That, that's just his illusion. He needs to listen to himself because. <laughs> and then you know, day by day. So, but yet, yeah, the tipping point was prepared, and it was about the elections. And then the second reason is we wanted to do it on the elections because we suffered so much from the lost media wars that we wanted to prove that the Serbs are a civilized nation. Because Milosevic was replaced in the elections, and since then we had like three or four election cycles. So we just now replace our politicians regularly on the election. So it was really important as a milestone to the free and fair elections. Because I don't think politicians really became better 
in Serbia. Just you can't find a bloody idiot stupid enough to steal elections after what happened to Milosevic. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so, question for you and any, anybody else uh, in, in, in the room. When I uh -huh. look at what you did with, with branding, you had a brand of resistance against tyranny. What we're dealing with here on Wall Street and financial derivatives that you need to know calculus to, under, to understand, it's much more uh, amorphous. So uh, there are maybe a couple of hundred people whose names, at least most of us in the room, probably don't know that are responsible for the financial mess th th that we're in. So I think one of the biggest problems we face is how we simplify that into a brand Sound that message, offers yes. an alt And I don't have the answer. <laughs> Maybe you have examples from the people, people you worked with that came back. Sure. Mm -hmm. Well, OK. You're selling, you're, selling, you're selling insurance to a property you don't own yeah. and to everybody else that wants a piece of it. So I have insurance on your home, she's got insurance on your home, she's got insurance on your home, he's got insurance on your home. If your home burns down, they can't pay us. Well, well, one thing I, I have thought about it is, is value, and Umer Haq, who blogs for the Harvard Business Review, talks about thick value versus thin value. So a manufacturing company in Michigan that makes turbine for, turbines for windmills might be coming up with new technology that's really creating value versus people who are speculating and day traders, mm -hmm. they're not producing any value mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. in, 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 in what they're doing. But you know, to explain all that, it starts to get like you know, the tables of numbers and, and the parts per million of you know, the, the, the environment. So you know, I'm, I'm struggling with you know, <laughs> what, what, how do you make that into a simple <coughs> message? And I, I, maybe I could tell a question, because I think I understand. It's like, how do you identify a soft target? Mm -hmm. there's, there's a hard target in your instinct. You know, how do you identify a soft target? And and related to that, you know, what's so remarkable about your decentralized structure? How do you set forth a, a series of goals, priorities, and objectives without losing the decentralized power? By starting with what you want to achieve, and by understanding where you want to be, the ones the struggle is over, and by planning backwards. So. If you want to go there, we need to remove this 15 people from Wall Street, wherever, Ministry of Finance. <coughs> but first, we are going to do this. But before that, we need to do, it's like you look at your communication scheme, and then there are lot, like list of goals. And you have like four quadrants of these goals. So there is an exercise how you do it, actually. You distinguish your tactical information goal, like what the hell is happening in Wall Street? I don't know. So how do you explain to somebody common what is happening? there and then the second thing is how you drive somebody's emotions because the emotions are what drive people to join different movements so you move from informative goals to emotional goals and then you use these emotional goals to mobilize people you do it through the small victories and then you use this new authority you gain to gain more numbers and then with bigger numbers you come out with a little bit more bolder things to do so you can look at it as a stairs here, but in a planning process, this is where you want to be, and then what your strategy is, and what are intermediate steps, and what are the soft targets. So you can look at it from where you are standing now with 10 or 100 people, or you can look at it to where you want to achieve, and then plan backwards. Mm -hmm. It's like planning. How do you plan? A, 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 I, I got married a few weeks ago, and uh, organizing a campaign is like organizing a wedding. <laughs> you look at how the event is going to look the way you want it, and then you plan backwards everything from invitations, you know, to number of people, to where people will sit, where you will have ashtrays. If you do it outdoors, you know, where the people will pee, so you need kind of mobile toilets and stuff like that. <laughs> no, these are serious things. Yeah. And in planning wedding, I dis discovered that there is 116 things. <laughs> you need to put in your calendar to make a successful <laughs> wedding. And when it's over, it's not over. <laughs> because you need to deal with presents, you need to pay to the music. There are a lot of follow-up once your wedding is over. Okay, the torture begins. <laughs> <laughs>
but this phenomenon, the complicated name, scientific name for this is inverse backwards planning model. <laughs> and also just revolutionary movements, there's been, um, in the splintering of, of subgroups that way, there's been sometimes a um, clash between what what are our tactics, uh -huh. and in that sometimes there's those that are more violent, those that are less violent, those that, you know, there's disharmony in that. And I'm, um, I'm astounded by how harmonious your effort was, despite the decentralized nature. What, if anything, would you set forth to, to maintain that kind of momentum that kind of all works together. Um, uh, it is also the, the, on the, on the, uh, in the field of communication, communicating with your members and supporters is equally important as communicating to the wider audience. Because you want them to be inside of this machine. You want them to feel like they're something really special because they belong to the movement. You want them to be ready <coughs> to take risk. You want them to feel this, you know, mutual thing, you want them to feel in, because they're in, and then you want them to uh, uh, understand the goals of the movement. But aside of the global goals of the movement, you really want to give them tools so they can plan. The more you train them to do it themselves, you know, investing into their skills, it is a very important part. So there was kind of a training process for these guys. And once they come out and they share the same values, and you're sure they're not going to go violent, and then you give them the toolbox so they do their own activities themselves. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So you just put them in a frame, give them tools, and leave them do it. That, that has been proven very efficient in Serbia. But then again, Serbs are not Germans. If we would try to put Serbs or Japanese into the system where everybody has its own compartment, it will turn out ugly. Serbs don't operate this way, mm -hmm. except in the basketball. <laughs> and how far do you let uh, pre-existing political parties be a part of it, and, and how do you make sure that they don't kidnap your agenda and, and run, you know, go their own way with it? Well, this is the toughest le lesson we learned. We learned it in 1997. Uh, we won these local elections, and then the students and parties demonstrated, and then Milosevic recognized the result, and then within a matter of months, Opposition parties split it apart and got into mutual clashes, and Milosevic was stable in government for two years. And uh, we understood, uh, well, first of all, you need to understand that the political parties are not a part of the solution. They're part of problem. And as long as they're disunited, they're part of problem. So what, you really, what we were really doing was communicating with them on a level of personal communication, and then creating the atmosphere in which everybody who works against unity is condemned. And there was this, Serbs are very far from politically correct people, and there was a slogan for this from the very beginning. The slogan was, ko izda pizda, which means whoever betrays is a pussy. And that was constantly repeated and chanted on big meetings by the people. So wherever you have opposition leader, there was this pressure coming from the people. So the real term is that we blackmailed opposition to run with one candidate. Just by embarrassing. But by embarrassing them, but by also creating this atmosphere that unity is what will save us. And then if this unity come, the traitor who you know betrayed unity is going to be condemned. And then we had 18 opposition parties running behind one candidate, and one big opposition party dropping from this boat, and they didn't pass the threshold. So this message was so powerful that actually we overtake their agenda. And we sit with them and say, OK, I mean, from the very beginning, there is a role for you guys. You are the alternative. You will be the government. So this is not a clash between us and you. This is everybody has its own role. We will do against stuff because we are so good in being national enemy number one. Milosevic likes us to be the national enemy number one. People join us because we are national enemy number one. They don't think you don't have guts. And they think you're doing this for your partial interest. So stick together. And so there are like five different campaigns going on in 2000. The presidential campaign of 
Koštunica, the candidate against Milošević, the campaign of Otpor called Gotovia, which was completely negative, the campaign of the, of the group of NGOs, also coordinated with us, which was called it, It's Time, whose role was to get five million mo more people to the voting places, like we need five million up, we need half a million first-time voters to come on, and because young people in Serbia, they don't vote. It, at that time, it was 72% turnout. So our idea was, you know, because that was the tool to stop or at least to diminish the effects of stealing the election. So we had four or five major campaigns going on, and it was all very complicated for the government to deal with because they were attacking Otpor while the opposition was gaining votes. That was a kind of the trick game. One more, and then we go. When she found out that you were on a government target, Sorry? What did your mother say when she found out that the government was targeting you for assassination? Oh, she was worried, but then again, I mean, my parents are, were very supportive about what I'm doing. <laughs> and that was, that, was, uh, that, was, uh, that was very interesting because they were both intellectuals. And uh, my father was one of the biggest Serbian journalists ever. And he was like the first Eastern European journalist ever wounded on the battlefield in Lebanon and stuff like that. And my mother was the uh, anchor of the, of the state TV news. And my, my father already got retired in the early 90s, and my mother was uh, really humiliated and, and because the state TV was actually the ruling party's place. So she was removed and, and kicked into the corner after you know, anchoring the TV news for 25 years. But she was very supportive, and I, I bet she was very scared but somehow they, 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 they grow me the way they, they respected my decision. And I mean, I can bet that she's still not very happy that I'm meeting Syrians of this world. But then again, I mean, I, I always speak to her like, you know, I had this newspapers from uh, 70s. And this is the picture of my father being wounded, wounded in Lebanon. And, you know, he made a show out of this. He put uh, straps over his head. He appeared on the TV. And the title is Gde su krize, Moma grize. So wherever crises are, the Moma is biting. Moma was his name. Okay, so I keep this piece of the 1970s newspaper. Whenever she comes to me with the strange ideas that maybe going to Zimbabwe is not the most clever thing to do <laughs> next week, I show her this piece of paper and I say, sorry, you, you, sh you should marry lawyer, doctor. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm a biologist, and I know genetics, so I mean, it's like, it's at least half your fault. <laughs> okay, anything else? Chief, are you satisfied? <laughs> this is, these are some presents, like three books and a movie, so you can agree. Who is getting this? <laughs> the Serbian lottery. We'll keep one at uh, the Hemisphere Institute. Okay. If anybody can come and read it. Thank you so much. That's so inspiring. And this makes sense, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I think so. There's a lot to apply in our context. And, and, and if you are interested in, in, in any additional material, if you're interested in any advising stuff like that, I will leave a few cards, so just feel free to contact me. I'm, I respond my emails regularly. More or less. <laughs> thank Great. you. Um, yeah, thank you so much. So very inspiring. And, That's uh, my yes man. <laughs> <laughs> but he's this guy. He doesn't have his, his, his nerd glasses. <laughs> <laughs> he's undercover. Always. Um, so I, I just wanted to mention uh, next week, next Wednesday, usually it's Thursdays, um, next Wednesday we've got a couple of climate activists from the UK, including one whose name is John Stewart. So come see John Stewart next week. Uh, he'll, they'll be explaining what they're doing in the UK, one of the most vital nonviolent movements in the world. Um, and that's next Wednesday. You can see the whole schedule on yeslab.org uh, slash CAT, Creative Act. Thursdays. If you aren't on the list and you want to get email, uh, write your email down on a piece of paper. If anybody has a piece of paper, that's great. 
Uh, tomorrow, Friday, uh, 10 a.m., and every Friday, we're brainstorming creative nonviolent actions uh, at the Hemispheric Institute, which is 20 Cooper Square. That's where I go tomorrow, yes? Yeah, that's where he goes tomorrow, and you too, if you want. Uh, we started last week, and these two guys are leading one group around military spending, and there were four other groups, and it was very exciting. And They're traitors. Enjoying. Yes. <laughs> um, they're not in, in favor of military spending. It's against They are the traitors. Okay. <laughs> and the other thing is, uh, let's go down to Wall Street. And uh, it, it's four, four or five stops on the R train, which is a block up. Broadway, you get on the R, you go down, get off at Cortland Street. If you haven't been there, it's really fun and inspiring and exciting to see real nonviolent movement in our midst. Um, and yeah, that's it. So there are people down there at this point? Oh, there's lots of people. There's hundreds of people. Yeah. And it swells to a thousand sometimes. And this Saturday, they're planning a giant march. There's a lot going on. And there's also a whole arts program that's forming and a messing with stuff program that's forming and it's it's pretty exciting. So <laughs> what's the stop again in the NDR? Uh, Cortland Street. You get off at Cortland and you go a little bit more south <coughs> and you'll see it.